of a five minute medicine series on acute kidney injury. Acute kidney injury is defined as a reversible decline in glomerular filtration rate. We use serum creatinine as a surrogate for GFR, however it is not a great measure since one can lose about 50% of their renal function before the serum creatinine becomes abnormal. The Acute Dialysis Quality Initiative defined criteria known as the rifle criteria for the definition and classification of acute kidney injury. The kidney is at risk when there is an increase in the serum creatinine of 1.5 times the baseline or a decrease in GFR of 25%. The kidney is injured when the increase in serum creatinine is two times the baseline or a decrease in GFR of 50%. And the kidney is in failure when the increase in serum creatinine is three times the baseline or a GFR has decreased 75% from its baseline. Alternatively, an absolute serum creatinine of 350 54, with an acute rise of at least 44 is also considered acute kidney failure. Once you have determined the patient has high serum creatinine, you need to determine whether this is an acute rise in a serum creatinine or whether they have chronic renal failure. Features that suggest acute kidney injury include short duration, like less than three months, normal hemoglobin, normal sized kidneys on ultrasound, and if you were to do a biopsy, no scarring would be seen. Seek prior creatinine values, look at older records, contact the family doctor, and ask the patient. Sometimes they may know as well. Acute kidney injury can be classified into three main categories, pre-renal, renal, and post-renal. For pre-renal, there are three main things to consider, all of which result in decreased perfusion of the kidney. Diminished effective circulating volume happens in states where there is a high fluid status, but it is primarily in the venous system, such as in CHF or liver cirrhosis. Causes of hypovolemia like diarrhea, vomiting, blood loss, or dehydration can result in decreased perfusion of the kidney. Some medications affect the ability of renal arteries to adjust, including ACE inhibitors and NSAIDs. In terms of renal causes, there are several causes that are best sorted anatomically. Diseases of the renal circulation can cause renal failure, including renal artery stenosis, cholesterol emboli, microangiopathic causes like TTP or HUS, and vasculitis like polyarteritis nodosa. Diseases of the glomerular membrane, such as glomerular nephritis, can also cause renal failure. Acute tubular necrosis is death of tubular cells, often due to prolonged ischemia or nephrotoxic drugs. Acute interstitial nephritis is an inflamed interstitium due to an immune-mediated reaction, often concurrent with allergic symptoms. Renal failure may be due to intratubular obstruction. For instance, there are high protein deposits intratubularly in multiple myeloma or diabetic nephropathy, or uric acid deposits in gout. Post-renal causes include two main categories. One is obstructive, which causes renal failure by not allowing urine to pass through the site of obstruction, which puts pressure upward onto the kidneys. For instance, ureteral blockage due to stones, tumors, or clots, and prostatatic obstruction due to prostatitis or BPH may all cause renal failure. Two is neurogenic bladder, which means bladder dysfunction due to neurologic damage, nerve injury, or medications which cause slowing of bladder function, such as anticholinergics or narcotics, can all cause renal failure. The history is focused around symptoms and determining the etiology. In regards to symptoms, ask the patient how often they are urinating, or if you have accurate outs measured from a nursing home or on the ward, record their urine output. A patient with proteinuria may have generalized edema due to low oncotic pressures intravascularly. Hematuria may suggest the patient has glomerular nephritis or an obstructive cause. Renal failure causes buildup of waste products, generally termed azotemia, which can cause an altered level of consciousness. One of these products, uric acid, can cause gout, pericarditis, and itchiness. Rash or joint pains may suggest a vasculitis. In regards to etiology, ask the patient about a history of renal failure, diabetes, lupus, and amyloidosis. Past abdominal malignancy, or BPH, may suggest an obstructive cause. Common insults to the kidney include hypovolemia and medications, so looking for a history of fluid loss and a detailed medication history, including asking about radiocontrast dye, are vital to a good history. Also consider if any medications they are on need dose adjustments while in renal failure, such as digoxin or certain antibiotics. Lower urinary tract symptoms may suggest prostatitis or BPH as a cause. Allergic symptoms such as hives, angioedema, and wheezing may suggest acute interstitial nephritis. Recent strep throat may suggest a post-strep glomerular nephritis. On physical exam, it is important to determine the volume status. This will help separate the differential diagnosis of prerenal causes from renal causes. You will want to check the vitals. Assess the patient's volume status by checking for an orthostatic drop in blood pressure or rise in heart rate, a flat JPP, dry mucous membranes, and increased skin turgor, which all suggest hypovolemia, causing prerenal failure. Look for signs of heart failure, including a high GVP, crackles in the lungs, S3, and peripheral edema, which may suggest decreased effective circulating volume causing prerenal failure.
friction rubs, or hardened pericarditis. Abdominal exam should be performed to look for signs of liver cirrhosis and masses which could be causing post-renal failure, including a rectal exam for an enlarged prostate. Mental status should be assessed as patients may become confused due to azotemia. Signs of high urea levels include pericarditis, uremic frost, and asterixis. Basic workup includes creatinine, BUN, electrolytes, and blood gases. Often a blood urea nitrogen to creatinine ratio greater than 10% is suggestive of prerenal failure. This is because both creatinine and urea are normally excreted by the kidneys. However, in dehydration, urea is reabsorbed by the kidney and is followed by sodium and water, so these patients have a relatively high BUN. Blood gases may reveal acidosis, as the kidney may have impaired hydrogen ion excretion. Hyperkalemia is also a concern. Other labs to order include extended electrolytes. Patients with chronic renal failure may have low calcium and high phosphate. A urine microscopy for CAS is very helpful for many renal diseases. RBC CAS suggests glomerular nephritis. White cell CAS suggests interstitial nephritis. Muddy brown granular CAS, also known as epithelial cell CAS, are suggestive of ATN, and fatty CAS may be seen in nephrotic syndrome. Order urine sodium and urine creatinine to calculate the fractional excretion of sodium. A renal ultrasound is useful to look for signs suggestive of obstruction like hydronephrosis or small shriveled kidneys which can be a sign of chronic renal failure. It may also see thromboemboli of the renal arteries causing a prerenal picture. If your preliminary investigations are suggestive of a glomerular nephritis, serology studies can be considered. An EKG should be ordered if the patient has hyperkalemia or if you suspect pericarditis. If the renal diagnosis remains uncertain, consult a nephrologist. Now that you know what to order, you need to interpret your investigation results. Patients with prerenal or postrenal disease often have a fractional excretion of sodium of less than 1%. Their urinalyses are not exciting, they often have no protein, no blood, no cas. The urine sodium is low because the kidney is not wasting sodium. The specific gravity of the urine may be high, which suggests the patient is dehydrated. Patients with renal dysfunction often have a fractional excretion of sodium greater than 1%. Their urinalysis may have protein, blood, or cas. Other lab investigations may also reveal signs of tubular dysfunction, such as acidosis and hyperkalemia. The urine sodium is greater than 20 and often greater than 40. Someone with proteinuria should have a 24-hour urine collection to quantitate the protein in the urine. Renal failure can result in some life-threatening signs and laboratory results if you come across hyperkalemia, metabolic acidosis, chest pain, dyspnea, or hypoxemia. Make sure a senior medical resident is aware and can help you manage the situation. In summary, a general approach to acute kidney injury is to sort out causes by prerenal versus renal versus postrenal, ruling out postrenal causes with imaging and Foley insertion, and prerenal causes by volume status assessment and intravenous hydration is a reasonable first step. Laboratory investigations can also help sort out renal versus non-renal causes, but when they do not, nephrology consultation may be necessary.